It really then comes down to looking at the marketplaces, not as uh, advertising vehicles, not thinking of e-commerce as another marketing channel, but understanding that the funnel, the purchase funnel for the consumer has been flattened and it goes from discovery to purchase intent to conversion in almost instantaneously. And so it's just a different way to think about the marketplace. Welcome to the Inside Forbes Council's podcast. Each episode shares transformative insights and advice from members of Forbes Councils, a group of invitation-only communities for successful executives and entrepreneurs. This is Inside Forbes Councils. Hey everyone, this is Stephen Ganoza. Welcome to Inside Forbes Councils. Today, we have my interview with Marcus Startzel, the CEO of Whitebox. Whitebox offers next-generation e-commerce sales and fulfillment solutions that enable brands and manufacturers to increase sales and reduce cost. We discuss the macro trends that are enabling the rise of direct-to-consumer brands, how to build awareness when there's more consumer choice than ever before, and why e-commerce is not simply just another marketing channel. All right, so Marcus, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, before we get started, why don't we have you tell us a little bit about Whitebox and the work that you do? Whitebox is an e-commerce technology company uh, with uh, the modern way consumers buy products, search for products and discover products. More and more challenges uh, are, are put upon the brand to meet those customers and be able to not only sell, market sell and fulfill their products, but also do so profitably and with a great customer experience. And so at its core, Whitebox helps brands uh, navigate the new modern commerce dynamics. So what are some of the specific problems that you solve for your clients? We have two basic types of clients. Uh, the first client is a client who has a, a product in a store. Think of a bottle of ketchup uh, that for years has been purchased in store um, and uh, not really ever really gone direct to consumer. That brand is now thinking about and, and struggling with in some cases on how to be more direct to consumer and how to respond to that changing consumer demand. The other customer that we're really successful for is you know, a new startup brand, a challenger brand that's born digital, likely uh, went direct to consumer before it ever thought about going into stores. And so as those brands get bigger, as they get to the five to $10 million worth of annual sales, then it, the, to grow past there, there's a, a level of complexity and knowledge to uh, not only expose their products on the marketplaces, but also to get into physical stores. And when you do that, it just creates a lot of pressures on your supply chain and inventory. And so I think both of those customers uh, have a um, have a, an, an affinity for a solution like ours. Because what we essentially do is provide them e-commerce expertise and the ability to not only sell, market and sell on the marketplaces, but also fulfill directly to the consumer, uh, use, utilizing uh, Amazon's fulfilled by Amazon, all different sorts of ways that we can get that end product to the consumer. And so balancing that, the ability to move stuff and sell stuff uh, is really powerful for both of those customers. I'm going to push you for a little bit more detail here. Uh, the services that you provide, um, tell me why your clients can't just do that themselves, right? There are other products like WooCommerce or Shopify. What additional value does Whitebox bring? When when customers come to Whitebox, uh, they've probably already tried different types of avenues to sell their products to customers. Uh, sometimes they'll have their own .com site built on a Shopify or a WooCommerce. Other times they will have... Uh, you know, dabbled or uh, done a great deal of sales on Amazon. And, uh, you know, the complexities associated with managing Amazon, uh, you know, some of those uh, include, uh, you know, the proper listing, the proper keywords, the proper ad strategy, you know, winning the buy box, managing resellers, lots of different things just on Amazon. And then also, if you think about the other marketplaces, you've got uh, Walmart, you've got to manage in a similar way as well. Uh, on the um, fulfillment side or the move stuff side of our business, you know, now you, you have to fulfill orders on your own.com. You need a capability to do that. 
you need a capability to actually inbound things into Amazon, whether you're working on vendor central or seller central in a way that you won't get a bunch of charges or chargebacks from Amazon, but also always stay in stock. And so when you, you think about the modern commerce uh, ecosystem today, where a consumer can buy that bottle of ketchup from almost any store in any variation uh, to flip side then the, the brand's challenge to get that to a customer uh, from an inventory perspective. You know, if, if a brand is using uh, one uh, a third party logistics provider to uh, fulfill their .com website, if they're using another for wholesale, if they're using yet another for Amazon, uh, then what you have is you have a siloed inventory that can't be used. And, and so because we uh, do all of that from one source of inventory, we enable inventory pooling. And that, that uh, you know, a theoretical bottle, a bottle of ketchup that's sitting in our warehouse on a pallet can be used at any given moment to fulfill an order on Amazon, to fulfill an order on any marketplace, drop ship to any, uh, drop ship to any um, store, uh, or their .com, and it's incredibly powerful. And so I think as brands get to a certain level, uh, certainly the challenger brands, and they start to really broaden uh, you know, the ways they go to market and reach consumers, that's when I think the solutions that we provide really light up uh, the value for them. So then what does success look like for Whitebox? Whitebox is successful when our customers are successful. And our customers are successful when they are able to meet their customers and meet that demand wherever that demand is. And so whether the customer wants to buy their product on a marketplace or their customer wants to buy their product directly from .com or their customer wants to walk in a store and buy their product, we are successful when that product sells, uh, when we've enabled that sale, when we've enabled the fulfillment of that pro uh, product, you know, and, and watching a growth of a brand that, uh, that we work with like that, that's really when we are successful uh, in, in our efforts for our brands. So a lot of the work that you're doing uh, and your success is dependent upon direct-to-consumer becoming more and more of the norm. Um, so let's just take a step back. Looking at the macro level, set the scene for us. Why is direct-to-consumer something that's coming about now? How much of e-commerce is commerce? Should we even be differentiating the two uh, anymore? The growth of e-commerce and direct to consumer is undeniable. Uh, we're approaching a, a trillion dollar uh, US only e-commerce sales market. And at the same time, we've got more and more direct consumer brands launching every day. Uh, only 15% of commerce today and growing is e-commerce. Is e and so uh, I, I think we've seen in recent times the, the rapid adoption of uh, e-commerce uh, purchasing items that you don't have to go to a physical store for that is just accelerating. Uh, it's, it's the driving force behind a lot of the new economics that we call modern commerce, you know, this ability to respond to consumer demand wherever it is. And so I think those trends, A, are undeniable and B, uh, are creating, the, you know, the complexities, quite frankly, that a technology platform like Whitebox is ideally suited to. Uh, to address. So you threw out a term there, modern commerce. What do you mean by modern commerce? Modern commerce is a concept where, you know, as the world shifts from purchasing everything in brick and mortar stores to much more being purchased via e-commerce and, you know, direct to consumer without ever leaving their home, it is that transition to the multiple marketplace, multiple outlet uh, complexity on the fulfillment side. And so the, if you were going to buy a bottle of ketchup 25 years ago, you were probably buying a bottle of Heinz ketchup because it was the brand that you knew very well. And you were getting that in a store and you only knew what brands were available based on what was on that shelf. And the brand only had to make sure that they kept the ketchup on that shelf. Today, if you're buying that same bottle of ketchup, there's no less than a hundred different places you can buy it. You could buy it in a one pack, a two pack, a four pack, the variety pack, just with the mustard, the picnic pack, the tailgate pack, 
there's so many different options available to the consumer. And quite frankly, the rise of that consumer choice and optionality has driven the complexity onto the brands. And ultimately, that is at the core of what we think of as modern commerce. All right. So what macro trends or catalysts do you believe are causing this move to direct to consumer sales? There are a couple macro trends that are driving us towards this direct to consumer model. I, I think over the past decade, you know, we've seen a lot of subscription services. We've seen a lot of, you know, new entrants to the market, skipping through the, skipping over the standard channels to get to consumers and, you know, getting funding and launching new brands. And I think that has really created an incredible amount of investment uh, from in, into startup companies, and you know, you know, some of some categories like food and beverage are just seeing incredible amounts of venture capital pouring in. So there's a great number of brands, um, and so those great number of brands are are being launched because consumers are responding to the choice. You know, they consumers have now been conditioned by several large players that. Uh, they should not have to leave their house and they can expect something will come to them that they want to buy um, in two days or less. Um, you know, when's the last time you searched for something you wanted to buy on Amazon and it wasn't on Amazon? Uh, I think that's the expectation that's driving that ease the, you know, the convenience, um, you know, and, and I think in recent times, people who wouldn't normally do that, who are more comfortable going to the store, have had the opportunity to actually experience e-commerce and found out it is much easier and much more convenient and you can do it for about the same price and save a lot of time. And so I think just those macro trends of consumer convenience, consumer choice, uh, and, and quite frankly, almost an endless amount of discovery on the e-commerce platform um, is ultimately the, the macro trends that will drive and continue to fuel more investment into direct consumer, which ultimately feeds the you know the growth of e-commerce. Tell me a little bit about the tools that a brand needs in order to bring a product to market. For a brand really to be successful in e-commerce and direct to consumer, there are you know multiple data sources that are available today. And the ability to leverage all of that data and act on it is, is really vital. And so uh, you get a, a wealth of insight and information out of you know, the, the, the selling of those products. You get a wealth of information out of the fulfilling of those products. And then when you combine the both of those and you understand that you can optimize how you're selling with your fulfillment information and you can optimize how you fulfill with your sales information, Brand has that entire data set to leverage and action on. And so uh, we feel really strongly about having uh, a really strong retail layer, understanding what to sell, how to sell it, how to merchandise it, how to price it, an extraordinary high volume, low defect fulfillment layer, and then a decisioning layer in our platform that really creates the ability to take those data streams and find new sales, new markets, and higher profits. Got it, got it. So that's that's for bringing new products to market. What about legacy companies who are transitioning uh, to e-commerce, direct-to-consumer? What are some ways that they can assess and, if necessary, update uh, their legacy business models? If, if you're a traditional uh, consumer packaged goods company today with you know, a portfolio of brands that's been around for many decades and uh, you, know, you, you are built as a company to mass market a great product and then mass distribute that great product by the case and the pallet. And so I think in today's world where now consumers are seeing products directly, they're not buying cases in pallets. In fact, they're you know buying one packs or two packs or variety packs. If if you're a big company like that, it's not trivial to reinvent yourself from a direct to consumer in, into a direct to consumer company. You've got challenges around your accounting systems. You've got challenges around your inventory. Your you know m many of these brands uh, struggle to just be able to think about selling a single unit rather than a case as it's you know written into their systems. And so I, th I think today a brand like that, one, you, you, you need to make the uh, 
the decision that getting direct to consumer is important because all of the upstart brands, the challenger brands are taking your market share. Many have. And then it really then comes down to looking at the marketplaces, not as uh, advertising vehicles, not thinking of e-commerce as another marketing channel but understanding that the funnel, the purchase funnel for the consumer has been flattened and it goes from discovery to purchase intent to conversion in almost instantaneously. And so it's just a different way to think about the marketplace and, uh, and, you know, getting direct to consumer. And, you know, you see many brands even launching their own dot coms and some very successfully to drive consumers directly to their websites. And so I think, you know, that, that motion from a, a, a legacy or a traditional brand into direct consumer is a not an easy path, but it's one that we've helped a lot of folks uh, transition. And you know, I, I think it's going to be a, you know a major growing trend. So I want to ask for a couple more examples on how you reach the consumers, right? Because direct to consumer means that you go directly to the consumer. In, in the older model, right, uh, customers would walk down a supermarket aisle. There'd be this flashy packaging. Uh, you notice that packaging and be interested. Today, uh, you know something might catch your eye on Amazon, but you still need to know what to search, right? You still need to know uh, what keywords to put in. Things just can't jump out at you as easily. So if members, so if customers don't know what to search for, or don't know you even exist in order to search for you, uh, what are some of the ways, in the absence of flashy packaging on the shelf? that you catch a customer's eye? Yeah, I think there are lots of different ways where direct to consumer companies are finding unique and interesting ways to get to the consumer. Uh, and uh, if, if you think about the absence of that store shelf, what, what you really have left is the modern way to get to consumers. And so we see a lot of our challenger brands you know, launching on Instagram, launching with influencers, uh, launching on Facebook, uh, using the, you know, the data and the analytics associated with a platform like that to find who could be their best customers and, and really, you know, expand from there. Um, and then, you know, and then expanding on to the marketplaces as well. I think it really comes down to what you, how you define direct to consumer. And there are some, uh, some folks who have a very narrow definition of direct to consumer, which is you actually aren't on marketplaces. You don't list on Amazon. You're not in stores and it, you can only be purchased directly from your own website or a subscription or something like that. It's a really challenging way to grow past the plateau of five to $10 million in sales. Some brands obviously are very successful at, at doing it. Uh, there's a lot of challengers in there, a lot of challengers that, go right to Amazon and ultimately have the opportunity to reach all those eyeballs. And so I think in a, in a, in a direct consumer brands growth, uh, discovery today, I believe starts with social platforms. It starts quite frankly, also very much with a ground game of going to, you know, fairs and swap meets and expos to, you know, to get the, their name of their product out there and, and build that loyal customer base, you know, but you know, the, Eyeballs, the consumers are on Amazon and Walmart and all the other marketplaces. And ultimately, uh, we think of direct consumer as a consumer who purchases an item on e-commerce that gets to them regardless of where the actual purchase point was. And I think we're very agnostic as to where that is because every channel has value for the customer as long as uh, it, it, it produces product on their a profit on their products. And so I, I think, you know, discovery is harder. It's, it certainly depends on what market you're in. If you're creating a new market, it's even harder because then how do you get people searching for that uh, if they don't know that it exists yet? And so I think it's a great question. So if somebody has got a company and they're like, wow, I could really use help with this and uh, white box sounds great. Tell me a little bit about how people can get in touch with you or learn more about white box. If you'd like to find out more about white box, it's very easy. Just reach us at whitebox.com. Uh, you can find out more about our products, our services, our leadership team, see some great customer, um, you know, case studies and client success stories as, as well as, you know, we like to keep our blog updated with different informational things that really help our clients uh, understand what's going on in the market. So whitebox.com. All right, excellent, Marcus. Thank you so much uh, for your time today. 
for more about retail sales. There's a lot that goes into scaling that a lot of people don't prepare for. And you really have to start scaling ahead of time um, when you're building that out. So understanding what your manufacturing capacity is, and if you hit or exceed a certain percentage, you're gonna to wanna to start scaling by buying new machinery or buying excess inventory and raw goods, making sure that you have the ability to in handle increased orders because you know, when something starts taking off, it takes off fast. Be sure to check out episode 75, where Joel Goldstein of Mr. Checkout Distributors explains how new products find a home in retail stores. Well, that's all we have for today. Thank you for listening. Be sure to subscribe, and we'll see you on the next episode. This has been Inside Forbes Councils. Please be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you're a member of the Forbes Councils and would like to participate in our podcast series, please email your member concierge. If you're interested in joining a Forbes Council, learn more at ForbesCouncils.com.